Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Samantha Fox and I am delighted to be here with our panellists today to talk about the Youth STEM Award. I'm a plant scientist and co-founder of the Youth STEM Award and today we're going to talk about all the amazing things going on right now that you can get involved with to work towards your award. So let's start by meeting our panel and I think they can introduce each other. So Mark, could you please introduce Lizzie? Yeah, absolutely. So I think with this uh, multi-screen wonderfulness, I think Lizzie is up there. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Mark. How's it going? It's working. So uh, Lizzie Daly, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, she's been uh, a common face on your screen, doing lots of work with the BBC. Uh, she, uh, she's got an animal behavioralist background, which is really quite cool. Uh, that, but that is the wonderful one, Lizzie Daly. <laughs> Yay! Thanks, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> So Lizzie, so are you going to introduce uh, Ben for us today? I am. So Ben, he is a beard growing evolutionary <laughs> biologist. A phenomenal beard, I think you'll agree. Um, he also featured, oh well he's been on your screens. Thanks Mark for that, that lovely introduction. Ben has definitely been on your screens recently with a brand new series called Baby Chimp Rescue, all about the Liberia Chimp Sanctuary, incredible series, check it out. Um, but he also featured on Pirates of the Caribbean. No wait, he did a PhD on Primates of the Caribbean, that's it. He's also <laughs> a primatologist, see what I did there, everyone? Good. <laughs> yeah, he's a professor, he's a phenomenal naturalist, biologist, all the boxes. It's Professor Ben Garrett. Oh, we've lost more. Oh, he's back. You. Oh, thank you. Yay. Yay. It was so good. <laughs> <to check out. laughs> so, Ben, over to you, please, to introduce Mark. Mark, I'm very pleased oh, to introduce right you. Way. Um, other way. Other way. Mark was born in 1973, which, oh, if it seems a long time <laughs> ago, is much closer to dinosaurs than me and Lizzie. So, what were the dinosaurs like, Mark? <laughs> Um, All I know is they were keen at hunting down, hunting down <laughs> big growing primates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they win. Uh, he is also one of Britain's most well-loved astronomers. He is a Virgo, he's keen to add, and he is often on our TV. Now, I did hear that Mark trained as a pilot before going into TV, which is genuinely incredible. That's very, very cool. He wow. is a Norfolk boy, which is the best county in Britain, obviously. And interestingly, I read earlier on your Wikipedia page that Mark only has four toes on one foot from an accident <gasps> on holiday when he was little with a penguin. <laughs> cut him off now. Let's cut him off. <laughs> is that true? I've got five toes. I'll show you if you want me to. Um, <laughs> maybe later. <laughs> Oh, Maybe I've got, I have got a finger missing though. Have you? I've got a finger missing. Oh, <laughs> get him off quick! <laughs> right, okay. I think I think we lost connection with Mark. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and welcome uh, to this little get together here online. So you all know that students can work towards a youth STEM award by undertaking STEM-based activities at home, at college, online, uh, remotely. Um, and some of you have even been logging some activities towards one of your own awards on the portfolio. So my first question to you all is, what have you most recently done to work towards an award? So who wants to kick off? How about you, Lizzie? <laughs> okay. Me, me. Okay. Well, so uh, obviously we're all at home right now in isolation and I've been trying to make the most of my back garden and getting outside and trying to find interesting and new ways to connect with nature. Now normally I don't get the time to be able to really dedicate some serious hours to going out and finding signs of wildlife and I have been very fortunate because back at the back of where I'm staying there's a bit of an empty wild patch and I have found owl pellets. So most recently in terms of activities, I have been going through picking up bits of fox droppings and badger droppings and owl pellets. If you don't know what an owl pellet is, is it's basically a regurgitated leftover bones for everything that that <laughs> owl could digest gets regurgitated up. And I've been picking through it to find out what small mammals are in the field. But I've been scrubbing up on what small mammals are in basically the back garden, which is just amazing. And I think I should get extra points for that extra fantastic Definitely. activity. 
Wow, that sounds uh, interesting and amazing, but definitely great activity. Developing knowledge and skills, I think, and now you've been telling us all about it. So great job, Lizzie. What about you, Ben? What have you been up to? First of all, Lizzie, which mammals have you found in your fields from your exploration? Well, I've set out some camera traps as well. So I found some field mice and some field voles. I found a field vole skull, which is pretty amazing. Wow. Cool. Thanks so, so yeah. as a... As a physics person my first question yeah. is why but we'll <laughs> bypass that what did you find by picking through all the poo so well the poo was the badgers and the foxes you kind of learn a lot about droppings and pellets um you can learn about their diet what they're eating how much they're eating and badgers for example they have one particular place they'll be doing their business and it's called a badge latrine so I can regularly go back to that badge latrine and find out how frequently that badger is visiting that area uh, I can look for signs of tracks from that latrine into the shrubs uh, seeing if I can find the, the set so there's lots you can learn from droppings and things but my favorite has been owl pellets definitely even the size and the shape of an owl pellet can tell you what species it's been regurgitated from and I think it's a tawny owl how cool is that that's pretty cool. Very cool. Top knowledge. Oh, An sorry. extra 10 points. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> no, I, see, I knew we should have scored this. This definitely should have been point scoring. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to tell it? I mean, who can beat that? Looking at who? No. no one. Go on then, Mark. Can I? So this is going to be, and you all know the secret here, uh, this is a very, very recent activity on my part. So my background, uh, astronomy, so uh, I spent a lot of time controlling telescopes around the world. I was using a telescope um, in Hawaii just a few uh, days ago um, to image distant galaxies. It's all very exciting, very cool. No poo involved. I can do that from the comfort of my home, which is great. But uh, drifting into the world of technology, mm -hmm. a big spoiler is that this lovely, luxurious looking apartment that I'm currently in is actually fake. If I yeah. just switch, yes. I just what? Uh, let's go into the garden. <gasps> <gasps> wow! I've got a little bit of a big hill in my backyard. So I'm just going to go up there and look at the go view. On. We go the, this is uh, actually completely fake. And if I can find the button, I can turn it all off. Don't do it. I'm sat in front of a green screen. How cool is that? So my house cool. is a bit of a building site. I'm just going to show the world. What my house is like as you can see if i spin it around it's not the best of backgrounds i've got quite a lot of building work going on so i thought as a bit of use the technology that's out there and i will be logging this uh i thought we'd go with some green screen technology for this call how's that so so fake news so you've been doing lots of fake news recently there has been no <laughs> Not I believed you were. I believed you were there then, Mark. I believed. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Wow, that's cool, yeah. isn't it? Isn't that so cool? Cool. Hello, yeah. magazine was knocking on the door, ready to do the a really, paper sheet. Then, but. do you know the really good thing about this is that the kind of technology for fake backgrounds is available to everyone. Uh, and you know, people are working from home. Uh, um, you know, it's great that they can kind of blur out their home background. They can change their background, and that's using the, the technology that's available on smartphones tablet devices, laptops, and every, anyone can do it. It's really quite cool. Mark, I have a question. Yes, Lizzie. Because, so, I know nothing about astronomy. I'm looking at you, Mark, right now, but um, I know nothing about yeah. astronomy. So I know, well, at least I've been seeing from your very active Twitter, that April is a really big month for getting outside at nighttime and having a look up to the skies. Can you tell me why? Because I just, I haven't got my head wrapped around it. <laughs> well, do you know, I think one of the reasons that, that the spring months are good for people getting outside is because it appeals to more newcomers. Now, the winter is by far the better time to get outside and look at the night sky, but in the winter it's really, really cold and it takes someone who's pretty dedicated to wrap up warm in like minus two, minus three degrees and get outside. But we have got a lot of really cool stuff to see at the moment. So uh, Venus is superbly visible at the moment. If you look over in the west, in fact, go outside after sunset, uh, and look at the sky, find the brightest object in the sky once the sun has set, and that is the planet Venus. It's so easy to see, you don't need a telescope. We've got a meteor shower that peaked just a few days ago, the Lyrid meteor shower, and also those pesky 
Starlink satellites, which uh, SpaceX have launched to give global internet access. They're up there and they've been quite visible as well. So there's been a lot of stuff combined with the nice weather, people being at home, not having to get up early, I think it's just helped to encourage people to get outside and enjoy the universe, which has been fantastic. I, can I just say, uh, sorry, but I saw a star the other day and it was traveling across the sky and it had, um, it had wings. And um, that, it was just would, moving. Did it have poo? What's that? It been, what, it been one of your birds? Been an aeroplane? You're talking about an aeroplane? That's the one. That one of those. Yeah, it's one of we, those. We have those in Norfolk. The technology oh, in there has That's arrived so here. Yes. That. We had electricity. <laughs> electricity? Electricity. Electricity. <laughs> we have that as well. The one behind electricity. <laughs> That's the one. Okay, Ben, awesome. what have you been up to recently? I have been, I've been doing lots recently. So I have been working with my university, UEA, in Norwich, and we have been, yay, we have been helping the local NHS with supplies of things they really need. Of course, we know that there's lots of problems right now with this, this new virus that's come out, and we need all the help we can get. So UEA, with the scientists and technicians and everybody there, has been involved in making more masks and special visors, um, even hand sanitizer, and we've got a whole production line of local companies and businesses along with scientists and technicians and some students even as well to try and help push them out and get them out to the local NHS. And it's been amazing. So people are working every day from all different walks of life. We put out a, a request on the local news and over 700 local businesses and companies and some individuals got in touch and said, we can help. So it's a real community project. So I've been involved with that for the last few weeks, which has been really good, really keeping me busy. Um, I'm also writing a series of eight books right now, all for young science readers. They're on mass extinctions. They're not the most fun, but they're interesting. Um, they are, uh, each one looks at a different mass extinction with a different species. Mark, yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you for picking me. Uh, so you talk about mass extinction. Are you drifting into the world of astronomy and physics, talking about asteroids, gamma ray bursters? No, a little bit, a little bit, Austin. a tiny bit, a tiny bit of that goes into space territory because a couple of the mass extinctions, you're right, have been definitely due to space activity, and one, oh. one we thought might have been. But we're now pretty sure it wasn't. So the gamma radiation burst. So, so sorry. This uh, nearly this. So this is about previous mass extinctions, not potential mass extinctions. This is about all the ones we know so far. So we say uh, we're now in the sixth mass extinction. Actually, we're not in the sixth technically just yet. We haven't seen the number of extinctions we'd expect to. And even if we had, this isn't the sixth. We've already had the sixth about two and a half, three million years ago. So I want to sort of teach about each one, investigate why extinctions are important. They're bad, but actually extinction drives evolution. It's the most important force in nature, extinction. So we want to, I want to try and look at that and explore. And each one tells the extinction of a particular species from T-Rex right down to Hallucigenia and Lysia wickia and all these weird and wonderful animals that a lot of people wouldn't have heard of. So I'm doing that. And I was on National Geographic the night before last, or was it last night? I don't know, one of the last two or three nights, with a, a very good friend of mine, Jane Goodall, in a documentary as well. So I've been on the TV, been writing some books, and I've been trying to help my university. So really busy, really, really busy. Oh, well, that all sounds fantastic. fantastic. From poo to mass extinctions, to everything, <laughs> space, <laughs> Starlink satellite, my goodness. Okay, right, well, what have you what i want to know is what is there anything that you've been doing or anything you're involved with right now that young people could maybe get involved with who are either already registered towards an, towards an award or who could get involved and start working towards their awards so who wants to kick off lizzie again hand up go for it lizzie i do and um, just because when was it now? A month ago when we really all started this time being at home more i definitely felt the the need or the want for more ways to inspire and keep connected with people about the natural world with astronomers like Mark and fantastic climatologists like Ben and so I decided to put a call out online to see if anyone would be interested uh, to deliver a 20 minute live lesson. I called it Earth Live Lessons and it's been running every day ever since. I was flooded with responses from people all over the world 
And it was really, really great because all you have to do is sit in front of the laptop and the times and all the speakers are up uh, way before so you check out who's talking and, and talking about and you can just tune in chat to the scientists or the conservationists or the filmmakers about whatever ever you want really um, and it's just 20 minutes every single day of a lesson and it's some are inspirational some are educational some are quite scientific and others are just a good chat about the natural world biology and natural sciences so that's what uh, i've been busy doing in the background um, yeah I would highly recommend if anyone's looking for daily activities or ways to get those hours in there is now almost 30 hours of solid content on there on my YouTube channel Lizzie Bailey Wildlife TV so tune in watch them and if you're extra keen on actually taking away some more information and learning a bit more you can actually download the worksheets from each lesson and fill those out as well so yeah earth live lessons go and check that out definitely have either of you done earth live lessons oh no <laughs> I've, I've watched some yes i've watched some right. and i was going well, to this doesn't look good for you in your hours does it doesn't look <laughs> too good for your awards everyone <laughs> Well, that sounds fantastic, Lizzie, and we'll definitely put the links in to the Earth Live, Earth Live lessons at the bottom of this uh, video in the notes. So that's absolutely fantastic. Are you eating your lunch, Ben? <laughs> I, I thought you were eating something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said yeah. it's informal, that's fine. But no, that's fantastic, Lizzie. Um, I, I've seen a couple of those. They are absolutely brilliant, and they would make a perfect way for people to get involved and watch those, uh, watch some of those videos and collect those hours. Has anybody else got anything that they've been doing that they want to shout out? Mark, go ahead. Firstly, I feel like Lizzie just told me off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. sorry. Sorry, Mark. I didn't mean that personally. Also, I'm loving your, your night stargazing. Thank you. Loving lovely it. link there, Lizzie. Ever the professional. So <laughs> one thing that You're I've welcome. been doing... Uh, much like Lizzie, I want to find ways to try and help encourage and engage kids in uh, education. It's very difficult for parents up and down the country to encourage and get their kids doing the work that quite a lot of schools are setting the kids. So it's very difficult for a lot of parents. So I want to find a way of getting astronomy or physics uh, out into uh, families and get them learning a little bit. So I thought, what better way of doing it with all these wonderful clear skies that we've had to get people out stargazing? So what I've been doing pretty much every night, unless it's been solid cloud across the country, where I've dropped you on one or two because there's just no chance of seeing anything, uh, getting people to get outside for half an hour of an evening, so 9 30, 10 o'clock now, the, the clock's changed, uh, and guiding them around the night sky. So it is as simple as getting on Twitter, following me on Twitter, and for the period of 30 minutes or so every night, and I was publicised at the time beforehand. Uh, I guide people around the sky, starting usually at Venus because it's really easy to find, uh, and mm. then tweet out what they can see. And I've got a hashtag which is Family Stargate with Mark, like that catchy little title there. Uh, it's great. And people follow that, so and I'm just showing people around the night sky. I've played around with with trying live streaming and trying audio feeds, but people like being able to check back uh, and look back at the previous. People get lost sometimes on that, uh, looking around the sky, um, and I've even developed this new, and you guys would be interested in being biologists, this new measure to guide people around the sky. Now it turns out that for everyone, the width of your fist, put it there, if you hold that at arm's length, thus covers about 10 degrees on the sky. That looks really okay. terrible. That's a bit more than 10 this. degrees, Mark. Anyway. Uh, so if you hold it up on the sky, your fist extended width 10 degrees it covers on the sky and I'm using this measure of a fist width or an FW. And on the sky I can say to people, nice. your arm, fist, fist. two fist widths to the left of Venus is that star. And I'm using it to guide people around the sky and it works really well. The beauty of it is that if you've got Fantastic. a small fist because you're little, generally your arm is shorter. And there's got to be a thesis in that, you biologists. Oh, Leave that I mean, one with you. Is that genuinely a new measure? People haven't really used that before. That's very yeah. exciting. It is exciting. It's been used on and off over the years, but it's not commonly used because often people are standing next to each other. But because I can't do that, yeah. uh, it's really difficult. And it's the only way to try and explain 
how to move around the sky is to use that gauge. It gives people a rough idea where they're looking. It works really well. Well, that's great. And I've seen some of these. I love um, the idea that people in. Go on, Sam. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, yeah, we've done. I've done some of that here, and um, we've looked along at, um, at people's astro, and it's really highly recommended. It's brilliant. We had a few trees in the way, but between the trees, we could see Venus and uh, the Plough, and then we saw the Starlink satellites come across. It's very good. And it's good, as you say, it's a great way to get thirty the idea minutes. People standing in their gardens like that, knocking it's each great. other out if they're not very Everyone's careful. Supermaning. Make sure they're keeping two yeah. meters distance as well. Right. Sorry, it was someone in my own household <laughs> that we were safe. <laughs> okay, Ben. So yes, that's what I'll be doing. Thank you, Mark. What about you, Ben? Are you up all to I can think people can I get I am, healthy? yeah. All I can think, Mark, is that it made me chuckle when you said longer arms and smaller fists. I now start thinking of other primate species like gibbons who have really long arms with tiny little fists. They'd be like, no, no. And gorillas with really short arms and massive fists. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely oh, a reason. Maybe I need to, <laughs> would I, so I, I need to specify one human fist width. Yeah. Yeah. At arm's length. Yeah. To make it one HFW. That would work, wouldn't it? Yeah. One HFW. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's easily confused. All those gibbons in zoos and yeah. forests around the world. They're probably <laughs> still sat there trying to work out where Arcturus is in Venus. <laughs> They're yeah. way off in the other direction now. <laughs> yep. Rubbish, rubbish. Uh, I'm not doing as much as these two uh, with this because I have been busy with other stuff, unfortunately. Um, but I did do a little thing this week with uh, another good friend of mine, as well as you guys, is Professor Alice Roberts, who is a very good uh, scientist and also broadcaster as well. And she was given a box of skulls by another academic and <clears throat> she was left them and couldn't identify them all. So she is on Twitter every Monday morning around about 11 o'clock and there's a hashtag, Dr. Bob Skulls. Um, we are identifying them with Alice to see how you identify different skulls, what the differences are and what you might, you might use to identify different, uh, different things there. And it's really nice because we're going through as scientists. So in the same way that Mark identifies different constellations and Lizzie identifies different different animal behaviours and different uh, bones in, in regurgitated owl pellets, we're doing exactly the same thing with bones. So if it's something if it's something this size, it's not going to be a mouse, whereas if it's something that size, it's probably not an elephant. Um, so we're looking at uh, quite fun ways to investigate things in science. So every Monday morning, hashtag Dr. Bob Skulls, there are some weird and wonderful things um, coming up this week as well. Yes, Mark? Which skulls were they? I know they weren't elephants. Do you mean were they weren't elephants? Were they? <laughs> there was a. Oh, those ones just there? Yes. That's my skull. Literally, my skull. Um, it's Is 3D it? printed. Ah. Oh. It's a 3D printed Ben Garrett skull. Wow. It's the only, I'm the only person in Britain, maybe the world, who has their own skull 3D printed off. Very so, cool. How accurate, presumably, we've all got so many questions, I know it's accurate. So presumably, were you scanned? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah I was in an MRI scanner, because you couldn't put me in a CT scanner because of ionising radiation. <laughs> I want one as well. Here's yours, Lizzie. I'll be, I'll be honest. <laughs> oh, that's more like it. That's little the gremlin skull. skull. I suppose that's a physicist brain, is it? Right, or skull rather than a biologist. Uh, uh, uh. What, what was the other one, Ben? Uh, so this is a, uh, a species of monkey from the Caribbean called a green monkey that I got the permits for and did my research, my PhD, uh, and it was taken from Africa to the Caribbean during the slave trade. No, it's, I was measuring the differences to look at how species start to evolve, a bit like Darwin's finches, but with, uh, with uh, monkeys, and really cool. The reason it looks so dark in there, and there's holes all the way around there, is because inside was an old termite's nest. So the termites were eating through the bones. So it's really cool to actually look at the skull itself, but actually see how bones and fossils degrade. It was cool to see how different animals impact uh, things like bones as well. So I've got a, in my office, there are lots of bones and bits and pieces. So I've been uh, playing with bones in lockdown. Lizzie. Yeah. That all what sounds fantastic. It? Oh, sorry, guys. I'm just going to tell you we are running a little bit low on time. So, quick fire comments now. Oh, Lizzie, so quick many comments. Questions. We could go on for hours. Well, I was going to ask you. 
I know. I was going to ask you, Ben, what can you really, if you look at a skull, the skull itself, obviously, if there's been termites on it, you can, you can understand that. But can you tell age and, you know, cause of death? What else can you learn from skulls? So I can look at that one now, looking from the top. There's the face. And you spin it around slightly. You've got a big line going down there. Now, that tells me, because it's joined together quite a lot, it tells me it wasn't a young one or a juvenile. But when they get older, they absolutely fuse completely because the skull's not one bone. The skull can be lots and lots of bones all put together as special plates. But when they get older, they start to fuse. We know this was an adult, but not a fully grown one. It's got a little crest. You can just see the crest on the top, which means it was a male. Uh, the teeth have dropped out now, but it has some big sockets where the big canines used to be. So we know it's a big male with a big set of teeth. Um, and usually by the size of a skull, the, uh, the body is about four or five times bigger. So if it's this sort of size, the body would have been about the size of a cat. So it's not the size of a gorilla, it's not the size of a person. So you're looking at a cat-sized monkey that was a male, that wasn't fully grown, that we can't tell how it died by this skull, so something on the body might have killed it. There's no signs of injury, there's no signs of shotgun damage, because people do shoot them out there because they're pests. Um, it, we don't know, we've got no idea looking, but sometimes you can see certain diseases. And I've got a kangaroo skeleton somewhere with all the bones are linked in in the back, they're all fused <laughs> together, so it couldn't, couldn't jump around, unfortunately. So yeah, look, it's like one big investigation, oh, very cool. Wow, brilliant. Pretty cool. Oh, that's <clears throat> fantastic and so interesting. And thank you all so much. So, uh, so we found out about Earth Live Lessons. We found out about uh, People's Astro Family Stargaze with Mark. Is that right? Have we got that right? Yes, spot on. And we've got Monday Mornings with Alice Roberts and Ben Garrard identifying skulls. So I'll put all of those links in, in the notes below this video. Is there anything else you want to shout out about right now that people could get involved in? Anything else you know about? Quick fire. Go, Mark. I mean, Ben. <laughs> Ben, sorry. <laughs> ben, <laughs> over to you. Sorry, he's frozen. Oh, he's, gone. Really he's gone. Oh no. <laughs> he's back. He's so that, gone. Was, that was Natalie from Norwich. That, that was Natalie from Norwich Science Festival. Um, just having a quick chat. Talking to Natalie off of talking to you guys. So we all have um, some wonderful technology that we all use. I know Lizzie's using incredible radio trackers. I've used lasers. Mark uses incredible telescopes. I would argue the most important piece of equipment any scientist ever has is a notepad and a pen or pencil. I hope Ooh. you agree, you two. So if we do this again, what I would say is get yourself Absolutely. a piece of paper or a notepad or a group and a pen or pencil and start <laughs> recording what you do. So whether you're looking at the space, look, looking up into space, record what constellations you see, what night, where you saw them, how many hands or how many degrees was between these different things. And with Lizzie's thing, you could do out. So I want you to start recording what you see. If you do a little diagram, great. You start recording the times, the dates, what you saw, when you saw it. You have no idea how important that little notebook will be further down the line. It's really important. So start recording what you're doing. It's, it's really cheap. You don't need a million pound telescope or a crazy laser in, in a laboratory somewhere. You need a pad of paper and a pencil and you start your science journey. Boom. Go. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And one more thing, if you do any of these fun activities, make sure you tag us all in it because we want to know that you have been out there, you've got involved, whether it's Ben's marks or the Earth Live lessons, please do get in touch. Just let us know on Twitter or across anything. We'd love to hear from you. And also, don't forget to log them as your hours on your year STEM awards, very importantly. One other tip for me, if I may, there's loads and loads of apps that you can download on your phones for gazing around the night sky. So if I'm not available, you can download apps and you can just literally point them at the sky and it shows you what you're looking at. Wonderful, really quick, really simple way of getting out there and enjoying the universe. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been lovely to catch up with you. It's been a really, hopefully, interesting chat. Um, please do go on and like and share the video. Look at the comments. What is that picture? Of, uh, no, I thought I'd explain that. So, <laughs> Look what we have to this deal was, with. What? I found filters. And one night when I was up a long while waiting for some images to come in, I started playing with some filters. And I thought I'd put out a funny picture on Twitter to show what my hair would look like in lockdown if I just left it. I went, oh, there it is. There it is. Lovely. <laughs> what? Oh, lovely. And lovely. my kid changed it to the background of my phone. I just haven't changed it back again. I must do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Keep it there. Keep it there, Mark. It's quite good. Is it, is it similar to what I really look like? Is that, is that similar? Okay. Better? I didn't want to say anything, but yeah, a little bit. 
the mouth is quite similar, but you know. Okay, so thank you everybody. Check out uh, whyisthewars.co.uk, follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and follow all the lovely patrons here. Thank you all so much for taking part, and we'll say thank you for watching if you have been, and goodbye for now. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.